in this episode, the beer garden physics need to know briefing on this stuff. High tensile drag chain. If you use this in four wheel drive recovery, is it likely to fracture and recoil and kill someone? I'm John Logan from AutoExpert.com. You and I get new cars. <laughs> Australia only. Website. Card. Got this missive here from T underscore Z, as they say in America. And it's kind of representative of a whole bunch of comments that have been raised in relation to things I've said about four-wheel drive recovery recently. So let's unpack that. There's a lot to go through. People have died in industry using chains. This is an absolute certainty. I found count them, two examples of that in the past couple of decades. So we'll unpack that, why it happened, how it happened, and how it impacts you if you've got one of these babies and you are tempted to use it out there, you know, on the road to Dingo Piss Creek. T underscore Z says, the chain might not be stretching very far at all, but that doesn't mean it isn't storing a large amount of energy. And then T underscore goes into a whole entirely unhelpful in my view, archery metaphor that I'm not going to inflict upon you. But what we're talking about here is you're dragging some stuck four-wheel drive out using a longer piece of chain than this, hopefully. They typically come set up for four-wheel driving with five metres of chain, so about a car length. And are you going to stretch it? And then is it going to break? And does it have sufficient elastic strain energy to form a chain mail like projectile that comes back through the glass at you or the poor bastard whom you are rescuing? So T underscore again. There is also at least one slow motion video available on YouTube showing chains breaking under tension. Yeah, there is. They recoil a bit. That's a certainty. Those don't drop, they recoil forcefully back in the direction they were being pulled. Well, what other direction would they recoil do? Because Newton's second law. And NT WorkSafe, so the WorkSafe mob in the Northern Territory, have a fatality on record from a tow chain snapping and recoiling back into the cabin of the tow vehicle in exactly this manner, killing the operator. That is absolutely true, but the circumstances there, which we will unpack, are very different to four-wheel drive recovery, and you'll see why in just a minute. T underscore again here. Opinions seem pretty polarised on this chain behaviour, and I assume there is a lot of variance in the situations where people have experienced it. I'd say opinions are like assholes, dude. Everyone has one, and it's what informs those opinions that really matter. And let's face it, a lot of this beard stroking out on the bank of the golden friggin' billabong might as well just be... <laughs> submerged for all time under all of that dingo urine for the value that it adds to the general understanding about recovery operations using straps and chains and whatever else. Because hardly anyone studied physics and yet everyone's got an opinion on this kind of thing. Go figure. How heavily the chain is loaded as a percentage of its limit, the metallurgy of the chain, what the failure mode was, physically compromised link, plastic deformation, question mark... Was it actually the shackle or the toe point that failed, etc.? Seems to me like either behaviour is plausible based on a range of factors, but the easiest way not to have to find out whether your specific chain is going to kill you in your particular use case is not to use one at all. Okay, so look, I'd say this kind of comment is emblematic of what happens when people sit down and they try to have a decent, pretty hard think about a hard to conceptualise issue, which would be the physics of the failure modes of various pieces of recovery equipment. They look for evidence online, they find some, and they make a wholly erroneous conclusion about just how dangerous a piece of this stuff is. Now, I just want to be really clear here. I'm talking about a specific kind of chain, right? This is grade 70 drag chain. It's meant in industry for tying loads down on trucks. It's specifically not for lifting overhead. The factor of safety is about two and a bit to one, you know, so if it breaks, this stuff is going to break at about eight tonnes and its working load limit is 3.8 tonnes. 
This is called 8mm chain. The 8mm, of course, being the diameter of the wire, the round bar used to make the chain. I hope you can see that okay just there like that. Anyway, it's 8mm. It's got nothing to do with the dimensionality of the links and you'll see that it's this particular kind of chain because every 12 links there's stampings on here which will be you know reasonably illegible but the stampings absolutely exist if I can just find one. Here's one. It's on that link right there and every other 12 links 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, hopefully. There you go, there's another example of the standards compliance stamping on the links. Every 12 links, that's how you know this is the stuff, right? And the purpose of standardising it is, of course, it's standardised, it's all uniform. We know how it's going to behave. The problem, I guess, lies with going out in the field and doing four-wheel drive recovery because unlike being in a factory and lifting shit overhead, you don't really know what the loads you're imposing are. But <clears throat> I do know that this stuff is rated, it has a what they call a lashing capacity of 3.8 tonnes. And it's got a braking strain, minimum braking strain of about 8 tonnes, which means a two and a bit factor of safety, okay? So you have to ask yourself, what kind of loads could I impose on this chain during a recovery? So let's, and I'm not talking about doing it like a snatch strap because nobody is suggesting that we back up bumper to bumper and then drive away as if the green light has just flashed on at Le Mans or something or we're drag racing at Eastern Creek. Not at all, okay? What I'm suggesting we do with this stuff is we drive gently to the extent of the chain we take up the slack and then we gently drive away and we use the tractive effort of the mobile vehicle to assist the recovery of the stranded vehicle. Okay, I'm not suggesting we just drive off and hope for the best because that is a really good recipe for breaking something because this is not elastic enough to take up much of the shock and something's going to break. Right? But if we do this drive away thing, I just want you to think about it like this, okay? Let's pretend that this is our struck four-wheel drive and this is our mobile four-wheel drive. Stuck, mobile, okay? And we're going to do the worst case scenario for loading the chain up using the tractive effort of the mobile one. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it on some really grippy bitumen, okay? And then what we're going to do with this one is dig a hole all the way around the vehicle, about two and a half feet deep, fill it full of rapid set concrete and just concrete it in place. And then we're going to put our drag chain in between them and think about what is the maximum effort that this vehicle can impose on the chain and therefore on this one. So if you're driving along in your reasonably well-maintained four-wheel drive, around the suburbs, whatever, and a kid steps out without warning and you jam on the brakes and the ABS activates, you've reached the limit of braking capacity, right? Because the tyres are starting to skid on the road. Now, that's why the ABS activates. And when that happens, you're going to be pulling probably 0.9 of a G. So if your vehicle, or let's call it 1G just to make it easy. If your vehicle weighs two tonnes, then the braking capacity is about two tonnes worth of retardation, okay? That's what 1G is. And then that means that if we get the vehicle and we put it in low range first, which maximises the tractive effort, then we weld up the whole drivetrain so that every wheel is synchronised. And we use an automatic and we drive off gently until all four wheels start to spin. They're just incipiently spinning then the tension in this chain is going to be two tonnes, okay? That's just the physics of how this works. And this is like the best case scenario for transferring effort into the chain to recover this vehicle. When you're out there in the field on the road to Dingo Piss Creek, it's much more likely that you'll be on a dirt road and it'll be a bit soft and you're not going to be getting anything like two tonnes into this chain, which incidentally 
is not going to break until you get eight tonnes worth of load into it. And its working load limit is about four tonnes, 3.8 for lashing. Okay, So I honestly do not see how in the field you are going to break a chain like that using a fairly standard four-wheel drive, unless you drive off like a fucking peanut. And let's face it, I'm not going to get obsessed about engineering out the idiot in all of this because it's just not possible, right? But if you do this responsibly, and let's say you're driving down the highway and there's been some rain and the table drains on the side are full of water and mud and someone's come off the road or they've just parked and haven't expected it to be that slippery and they're bogged down to the chassis, you could be in approximately that situation. You could be on decent bitumen five metres away from a car that's profoundly bogged in mud and you could be trying to rescue them. And I'd suggest in that situation, the maximum tension in this chain is going to be two tonnes and that's not nearly enough for it to acquire the kinds of elastic strain energy that would do any damage. Certainly not enough to break the chain or the hooks or the pins or anything of that nature. Now, I know that T underscore did say, what about if we break the shackle? Okay, so let's talk about that. This is a 3.2 ton shackle. It's common for four-wheel drive recovery. This is a 4.7 ton shackle, which is also pretty common for four-wheel drive recovery. Um, they come smaller. This is a one ton shackle, and this is, uh, Christ knows, you can read it. If you, if you possibly can, you can read it there, but you know, Basically, they come smaller, and guess what? They make them even bigger. I just grabbed one of these from a, a mate the other day. This is a 9.5 ton shackle. Now, the rule of thumb with shackles, and I've broken several of these, each of these, in testing laboratories over the years at the 3.2 ton working load limit. This shackle, if you load it up this way, the way it's meant to be loaded from end to end, not this way, they break a bit earlier this way, but about 25 tonnes to break this shackle end to end, pulling it apart this way, about 35, 36 tonnes to break this one, loading it in the same way. And obviously the advantage of this one for four-wheel drive recovery is not so much the additional strength, because I don't know where you would ever find 30 tonnes right out there on the road to Dingo Piss Creek. The advantage is the real estate because you can fit more things to it if you need to, more straps, more whatever, you know, more hooks. It, it's just got more real estate for attachment. So that might be why you want uh, some 4.7 tonne shackles. But obviously the, the downside there is it's often harder to get it into places on the vehicle unless you've got some very well-designed recovery points, which not every vehicle has. And for that reason, some of these smaller shackles are often a bit handy just to have as well. And they might as well be infinitely strong in the context of four-wheel drive recovery. The other caveat on all of this discussion, right, is that the equipment has to not be damaged because if you take the angle grinder to a shackle and, uh, you know, cut halfway through the pin, well, guess what? It's going to break earlier. And <sighs> straps are a little bit like that too. So if you use a winch extension strap or a snatch strap to pull a tree off the track that's blocking your path, then straps are really susceptible to abrasion. And likewise, if you've got a recovery where one vehicle's like this, another vehicle's like that, and there's a rocky shelf here and the strap goes over the shelf, then there's mechanical abrasion that's going to wear down the strap. And I'd suggest in those situations, a drag chain is more robust because a bit of sandstone is not going to do all that much to a chain of this nature, which is made of some fairly hard steel, which is heat treated. So the sandstone's probably going to come off a, a bit worse for wear, literally, than the chain in this situation, whereas the strap is going to be subject to abrasion and it has a limited capacity for that. Okay, So there's a lot of things to consider, is what I'm saying, with four-wheel drive recovery. And I'd suggest, yeah, there is some recoil if you manage to break the chain, but where are you going to find eight tonnes to break this chain? Okay, That's my central thesis to you. Where are you going to find it? Certainly the shackle is not going to break. It's virtually infinitely strong in practice, in the context of recovery. Comparing the 
strain energy in a chain to the strain energy in a strap, like a snatch strap. The energy in a snatch strap is significantly greater than the energy in a chain if they, if they fail, okay, if something breaks. And the energy in a snatch strap is so great that it could easily grab a sizable chunk of steel, totaling this or more, and even accounting for losses, it could hurl it towards you at three or 400 kilometres an hour, no problem. Now, the chain, if it breaks, unlikely, but if it does, nothing like that, nothing like as severe. So, sorry, detractors, and I know there is this evidence, and we are getting to it because I want to spell that out, Nuance is everything here. You can't just beard stroke your way through understanding this stuff. Now, some of the other things that T underscore said, well, if there's a compromised link or... Okay, so let's think about this. We've got a link that's been damaged, hypothetically. All that's going to mean is that the chain, if it fails, is going to have less energy in it because literally the weakest link is going to lower the failure load and therefore the elastic strain energy. Likewise, if a piece breaks off the vehicle and the chain is intact, then that load at which the whole system fails is going to be less than the eight tonnes at which the chain is going to fail. Okay, So anything like that, any compromise in the system is going to lower the load at which the system fails, which is good in the context of recoil and how it might affect you. Now, Another issue raised by T underscore was plastic deformation. Okay, now plastic deformation is like, I haven't got anything I can just plastically deform here, but you've done this with wire and coat hangers from the dry cleaners and stuff like that. When you get a piece of steel, you can bend it and it returns to its native shape if you don't bend it too much. And then if you bend it too much, like you get the coat hangers from the dry cleaners and you fold them up and you put them in the recycling, they stay deformed, right? That's plastic deformation. The beauty of steel structures, right, particularly low-carbon steel structures, is that they deform plastically before they fail. So you can kind of see that they're damaged and you go, oh, that's a bit damaged. We might have to do something about that. So it's kind of good. And plastic deformation is always going to be part of the scenario if anything breaks during four-wheel drive recovery, if it's metal, if it breaks. It's deforming plastically. That's just how this works. Not so much the snatch strap or any other kind of sling. That's more likely to fail at the, stri at the stitching or in a place where there's some other abrasive damage, like a big chunk's being carved out of it by something. Okay? So on this business about opinions, and I know everyone's going to have one in the comments, but if you've got an opinion about this stuff, and you didn't study physics. How about you just get smart enough to go, I might need to reassess this, or even I might be wrong. Because I worked in a testing laboratory for about six months when I was training to be an engineer. I broke a shitload of stuff. And then when I was a four-wheel drive journal, I broke a shitload of these in laboratories, you know, I did stories on the failure modes of snatch straps and winch extension straps and shackles and chain and all of that kind of stuff. It's really interesting, right? The shackle's not going to fail. I don't see how you can break the chain. In terms of the metallurgy of the chain, which is another thing that T underscore talked about, the metallurgy of the chain is standardised, at least from the point of view of its physical performance, right? Because that's what a standard is. It's AS NZS 4344 for this stuff, I think. And it defines the performance, like the loaded minimum braking strain, working load limit, etc. performance of this stuff. So the performance is standardised, ergo the metallurgy is standardised because dimensionally it's the same. It's 8mm chain as all the other 8mm chain. It's got the same minimum braking strain and the same uh, lashing working load limit, right? Lashing capacity, whatever they call it. So from that point of view, all 8mm drag chain is the stuff. Not that cheap galvanised fucking cheese that you might buy from Bunnings to, I don't know, to chain your trailer to the light pole out the front of your house or something. All bets are off with that shit, okay? But anything with a standard on it, with a rating, 
it's standardized. The metallurgy is not a factor, okay? I want to talk to you about these times when chain has actually killed people, okay? Because NT WorkSafe, this is the most recent one which T underscore referenced in his missive to me, right? This is the headline. This happened on the 25th of June, 2020. Chain recoil causes fatal injuries. And I don't want to trivialise this because some poor bastard died and that probably impacted, I don't know, 50 people directly. Like the people who had to attend the fatality and his colleagues and his family and his friends and all of that stuff. There's, I don't know if there were kids involved. They haven't got a dad now, right? Like workplace fatalities are terrible. They really are. And anyway, here's the story. This is the NT WorkSafe report on this incident. Okay, I'm quoting from it directly. In March of 2020, a 50-year-old worker was fatally injured when a chain used in a towing operation failed. If you read that and you're a four-wheel driver, you go, holy shit, Batman, I might have to think twice about getting this out. All right? The worker was operating an excavator to tow another excavator which had broken down. The chain was attached to the chassis of the broken down excavator and to the quick clamp of the other excavator. The excavator being towed weighed approximately 36 tonnes. So roughly 20 times heavier than your four-wheel drive. Big difference. The chain, when it broke, recoiled, striking the worker who was sitting in the excavator cabin. A terrible tragedy, any way you look at it. And even if there was an element of human stupidity in all of this, you don't deserve to die for, from stupidity, right? Because what we deserve, we've got to acknowledge that stupidity, unwitting stupidity in particular, happens from time to time. And that's why we need safe workplace practices to prevent that kind of shit from happening. You know, nobody's got an opinion about what size chain we should use in a crane that picks up a railway bogey and carries it over the heads of the workers in the refurbishment factory. Opinions don't matter. We've got a process for doing that and all the gear is worked out and that's why they never fall on someone's fucking head. That's how this works, okay? Possible contributing factors, according to NT WorkSafe, which investigated this, I'm presuming, with all due diligence. Number one, a risk assessment was not completed and safe work procedures were not developed for the recovery of the broken down excavator. And you might think that's just a piece of bureaucratic bullshit, but I'd suggest, having seen it several times, when you're out in the field and you see someone get stuck, there's all of this rushing headlong, seemingly in the vague direction of disaster, you know, unlatching the window for the Grim Reaper to come on through, when this need not happen, you don't have to rush into this stuff. You don't have to treat it like it's a medical emergency when someone gets stuck. You should do a bit of a risk assessment and make sure that all of the safe practices are in place, like getting all the bystanders away, etc. right? Choosing the safest way to do it, the one involving the least recovery loads and things of that nature. So risk assessment sounds tremendously formal, but you should do one if you are going to recover your vehicle or another vehicle out there in the field. You should go, how can we do this the safest possible way? And just, you know, defer to the dude with the most training and experience on this, right? Number two, the chain used may not have been suitable for towing. Now, understatement of the century, we'll get to that. Some links in the chain showed signs of wear and damage. Number four now, the quick clamp on the excavator where the chain was attached was raised at the height of the cabin. So basically, if there was going to be recall and you aim the gun at you, where do you reckon the bullet's going to go? This is why you need risk assessments, right? The excavator had previously been vandalised and the cabin glass was missing. So it would take some energy to fracture the glass and get to the operator. And I don't know if it would have been enough to save his life, but, you know... The glass was missing and it did not have the capacity to absorb any of that energy. I'm not sure if it was laminated or if it was just tempered glass, okay? So the chain that they were using to recover this 36-ton excavator was this stuff. It was AS4344 compliant 3.8-ton chain. It was 8-millimeter chain, okay? 
I can see how a 36-tonne excavator could have the capacity to impose sufficient load to break this chain in the same way that I cannot see how your four-wheel drive, driven responsibly, doing attractive effort type recovery, has the capacity to break this chain, okay? There's a big difference between 36 tonnes and slightly less than two tonnes, which most utes are, for example. It was also badly worn, the chain that they were using, and they've got shots of it in the report, right? It's gouged and bent in places, and um, it also had worn links. Like here, if you use a chain a lot, typically wears here where one link rubs on the other link. So if you've got damaged gear that needs to be replaced, like, fucking hell, dude, like, replace it. So this example from NT WorkSafe is a complete tragedy and that guy need not have died doing that if just a few things were different. But you can't draw a line between that fatality and using this stuff for four-wheel drive recovery. You just can't. Okay? I found another example which happened in New South Wales about a decade earlier, 11 years earlier. It was on the 17th of September 2009, incidentally, and the safety bulletin there which is from a dude named Rob Regan, who's the Director of Mine Safety Operations for Industry and Investment New South Wales. The headline there is Safety Bulletin, Broken Pull Chain Results in Fatality. And if you're a four-wheel driver, again, you're going, oh, Jesus Christ, here's two examples of chains being dangerous. They must be fucking dangerous. I'm never going to use one. Here's what happened here. Background. This is quoting from the uh, Industry and Investment New South Wales report into this fatality. Quote, directional boring contractors were withdrawing polyethylene pipe from beneath a creek. To retrieve the pipe, it appears that a nominal diameter 10 millimetre high tensile double leg chain, so kind of this stuff, only two millimetres bigger. 10 millimetre high tensile double leg chain was tied to the pipe via a clove hitch and the other end of the chain attached to a 20 ton excavator. 20 ton, so that's 10 times heavier than your four wheel drive, dude. It appears when the excavator pulled to retrieve the pipe, the high tensile chain broke and the polyethylene pipe recoiled. So let's just lay that out, the anatomy of that. The chain was weaker than the pipe that they were pulling. It broke and the pipe acted like a fucking snatch strap and recoiled. And somebody died, again, a terrible tragedy. And this could have so easily been prevented, even given all of the fuck ups, using a chain that was too weak for the job, etc. We'll get to that. There's another report from the same mob, titled, into the same fatality. It's titled, Directional Boring Fatality. Incident. A subcontractor suffered fatal head injuries when he was apparently struck by recoiling polyethylene pipe. Circumstances. Polyethylene pipe was being installed beneath a creek using the directional boring method. A pilot hole was drilled, then back reaming began, pulling a line of 200 millimetre polyethylene pipe behind the reaming tool. So this pipe is that diameter, about a hand span, right? Eight inches if you're in Morocco. During this operation, a crossover sub failed, whatever that is, and the drill string separated from the reamer assembly and the polyethylene pipeline. And I'm assuming all of that is like strategically bad, but not a disaster, just something that has to be fixed. Preparation commenced for recovery of the pipeline by pulling it back through the borehole from the entry end. A chain was tied to the pipe and the other end connected to an excavator. During the pulling process, the chain broke. It appears that the elastic strain in the pipe recovered violently. The deceased person was standing in the zone of pipeline recoil. If only he wasn't, right? What was he doing there? Was it essential for him to be there? Was... Had somebody not assessed that, right? That's what you've got to say. Now, grade 70 10 millimetre high tensile chain has a six ton lashing limit and it breaks at about 12 tons, let's say, two for one sort of thing. The conclusion here is that the pipe acted like a friggin' fully loaded snatch strap and it just recoiled and some poor bastard was in the way. 
and the chain once again was inadequate to the job at hand because it was pulling something that was it was just Mr. Puniverse in a fight against Goliath and it lost balance of probability. Now, this could have been prevented several different ways, right? You could put a load cell on the chain and it could have a wireless link to somebody's smartphone and they could just be going, no, we're at six tons, mate. We're going to have to stop now and we're going to have to go back and get some stronger chain because this ain't working, right? Reading in between the lines, they just went for it. The chain broke and then a disaster happened because of a range, a confluence of factors that boiled down to some poor bastard standing in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? But once again, you can't translate this failure to using a chain like this for four-wheel drive recovery because how the fuck are you going to break it, okay? That's my central thesis here is with a four-wheel drive, a conventional Land Cruiser, Hilux, Ranger, whatever, Everest, Pajero Sport, how the fuck are you going to break this? Like, it won't happen. Not if it's in good condition, not if you're just doing attractive effort recovery. The difference for complete disambiguation, a snatch strap recovery is where you use kinetic energy by driving away and not slowing down, letting the snatch strap slow you down. So you lose kinetic energy in your mobile vehicle, the snatch strap acquires that energy and it is transferred in a fairly gentle way, generally, to the stranded vehicle, which hopefully gets extracted. But people do this far too aggressively, and they treat it like a primary response as opposed to a last resort, right? A con attractive effort recovery is where you just take up the slack and you gently drive away without shock loading the chain. Much safer. Just gotta choose the right chain. And in the context of four wheel drives, this is the right chain. In the context of 20, 36 tonne excavators, things of that nature, Mr. Puniverse. They make much bigger chain, so use that, dude. If you want to do recovery safely, I've got these five rules, and they're broadly in line with a whole bunch of other protocols about four-wheel drive recovery, okay? You shouldn't be afraid of the gear. You should know how to use it. But number one, just do recovery safely by reducing the loads required to get the vehicle unstuck. Dig a bit, jack a vehicle up, put some logs or rocks or something under the wheels which have drooped right down and allowed the chassis to engage with the terrain, okay? Little bit of elbow grease, work up a bit of a sweat, much safer. You don't want to have to call care flight. You, you so don't, okay? Number two, dude, You've got to preference tractive effort recoveries over kinetic recoveries because they're just safer, okay? If you fail to get the vehicle out, you're more likely to be looking at wheel spin as opposed to tow bars and bull bars that come off vehicles or get reefed out or projectiles or anything of that nature because this is the door you open with kinetic recovery. It's the acquisition of energy. And the real tragedy of kinetic recovery and acquisition of energy generally is that you can't feel it. Like, you fly to Melbourne or you fly to Western Australia or something, right? You're doing 0.8 mark. <laughs> You've acquired a shit ton of energy. Like, personally, and the aircraft itself has just acquired a shit ton of energy. And it just feels pretty normal. Like, you're just sitting in a chair bitching about the service, you know? You can't feel energy is what I'm saying. Snatch strap recoveries might feel gentle but that in no way is representative of the capacity for mayhem inherent in the energy that is being transferred about the place, right? It's just not. You can't feel the acquired energy in many situations until something goes horribly wrong. That's what car crashes are, dude. Kinetic recovery is the last resort, okay? Point number three. Do it gently too. Like, when you, if you take the decision because whatever reason... Let's say you're on Cable Beach or something below the high tide mark and the tide is coming in and some poor bastard is stuck, clock is ticking, it's like going to lose the vehicle. I understand the imperative there, right? But you've got to start gentle, even in that case. Let's not back up bumper to bumper and then drop the uh, hammer on the whole recovery and just treat it like we're drag racing. 
do a couple of gentle pulls first and then reassess, maybe do a bit more digging and then do another couple of gentle pulls. Only do the really hard snatch as an absolute last resort and then I'd be putting some kind of ballistic arresting hack in place, like some lanyard on the eyes of each shackle at each end attached to a different point. Like a tree protector could function as a lanyard to catch something that breaks for example, okay, or a blanket, really heavy blanket. You could even get your chain and drape it over the center of the strap, wrap it around the center of the strap, whatever, because it will slow things down if something breaks, that's for sure. Now, obviously you've got to make sure your equipment is in good condition because if you've got chain that's been damaged, obviously it's not going to be performing the same as chain that's in good condition. But I've had this chain and I've used it heaps, and I just use it for little shop projects, like, you know, you can uh, you can put a jack, you can, you can connect it up around something, for example. You know, you just lock it in place at the right location, you get a jack in the centre, and you can just basically jack two bits of steel together that don't want to go together and can't be feasibly clamped by some other mechanism, you know. If it, it, throat depth, whatever, of the clamp is inadequate or it's not providing enough effort, you can hack this stuff into a like a three-ton clamp and it'll function pretty well. I wouldn't get in its way, though. I'd be jacking over here a bit. But you can hack it, is what I'm saying, and it's still in perfectly serviceable condition. And they are even, you know quote-unquote galvanized, like they're passivated. They've got this zinc, zinc chromate, I think it is, the gold stuff. Anyway, it cathodically protects the steel. So even if you just leave it in a bucket in a dampy, humid fat cave, it doesn't rust to pieces even after decades. So there's that. And finally, you know, I think if the second incident I talked about has taught us anything, it's that it's fun to watch Dad and the boys unstick a four-wheel drive on Stockton Beach and I've done that more times than I could count with my shoes off you know but you've got to get bystanders the fuck out of the way this is like job number one before anyone does anything else everyone who's not a part of this recovery operation like hands-on engaged in a recovery operation they've got to be like a hundred meters away doing nature appreciation out of the line of fire, standing on a sand dune watching whatever the fuck's going on elsewhere because it's a bystander who's likely, just as likely to get cleaned up by anything that lets go. And you're going to know one of those bystanders most probably and you will never forgive yourself. Like, in a sense, if you die, your problems are over. But if you're engaged in a recovery and it kills or maims somebody else... And particularly if you know them, you love them, you're a family member, whatever, you're never going to forgive yourself. So recovery step number one, get everyone who's not involved the fuck out of the way. And all of that effort that you've been devoting, perhaps like T underscore here, to what if the chain breaks? And what did he say? The safest thing is... Um, the easiest way not to have to find out whether your specific chain is going to kill you in your particular use case is not to use one at all. I'd say bullshit on that, dude. It's much more dangerous to use a snatch strap if you could get away and recover the vehicle using a chain instead. So I'd be prioritising the relative merits of recovery operations based on the inherent risk of those operations. And in here, it's like rock, paper, scissors, dude. Chain beats strap 